Greece, home to one of the most famous citadels on the planet, the Acropolis. Here, the most emblematic monuments of antiquity seem to watch over the Greek capital. The imposing Parthenon, spanning more than 2,000 square meters. The Propylaea, the Temple of Athena Nike, and the Erecteion. Four iconic buildings made up of 100,000 tons of marble, which the ancient Greeks hoisted to an altitude of 157 meters more than two millennia ago. You feel like you're kind of looking at something that humans thousands of years ago, and for all the time in between, have been looking at and going, wow, what an incredible monument that is. How did they build it? For nearly two centuries, multiple generations of archaeologists and historians have set to unravel the secrets of the ancient Greeks and discover how and why they built these marble giants. Each block was made for a specific location. You wouldn't be able to fit it anywhere else in the monument. The builders who worked on the Acropolis were clearly the best in the region. Thanks to computer-generated reconstructions and the greatest experts in ancient Greece, you are about to discover how Greek builders managed to extract and transport tens of thousands of marble blocks to build these temples in just 15 years. They were for sure fantastic craftsmen and workers. And if you work here, you can see it every day in the perfection and the precision in the marble surface. You are about to uncover the engineering skills that the ancient Greeks had to develop to assemble marble blocks weighing more than 10 tons, as well as the anti-seismic systems concealed at the very heart of the stones. Greece lies in the seismic arc of Europe. They undoubtedly took that into account in designing their monuments. You'll also see the many optical corrections hidden in the lines of these monuments that border on architectural perfection. The Athenians of the time used the most advanced technological refinements that were known to mankind. It's just one of the most iconic sites archaeologically ever. This is the story of the Acropolis and the Greek builders who managed to master marble to build an architectural ensemble like no other in the world. In southeastern Europe, Greece is nestled on the northern shores of the Mediterranean basin. Its capital, Athens, stretches over 40 square kilometers. It is home to one of the most iconic sites in the world, rising 157 meters above sea level, the Acropolis. This rocky plateau spans over an area of 4.5 hectares, the equivalent of more than four soccer fields. It houses buildings that are truly unique, such as the Parthenon, the Erecteion, and the Propylaea, the fruits of a thousand-year-old civilization of builders. Athens is indeed one of the oldest cities in the world. Its history began more than 6,000 years ago. In the Neolithic period, prehistoric men settled in the region. They first took shelter in caves on the sides of this limestone boulder. Then, over the next few thousand years, the population settled more permanently. In the Bronze Age, around 1600 BC, the first great Greek civilization settled in the region, the Mycenaeans. 
These warriors were the first to make their mark on the famous boulder. All around the summit, the Mycenaeans erected imposing ramparts, measuring more than three meters high by four meters wide. Today, a few parts of these fortified walls are still visible. They are the oldest remains of the Acropolis. Insurmountable, these ramparts were likely intended to protect a citadel that no longer exists. According to certain archaeologists, the fortifications housed a royal palace, as well as dwellings for the elite. The Mycenaeans dominated the region and colonized the territories of present-day Greece until the first millennium BC, a time when the mighty civilization suddenly collapsed. Several theories have been put forward for the disappearance, or the collapse rather, of the Mycenaean civilization. It might have been caused by raids from outside, invasions from other people. It might have been caused by catastrophic natural events, including earthquakes or even volcanic explosions elsewhere, which then led to a string of events that changed the environment. We simply do not know. Despite the collapse of the Mycenaeans, the region continued to be inhabited. In 800 BC, the various hamlets scattered around the hill created a city-state with common rules and gods. According to Greek mythology, two gods coveted the ancient city, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war, and Poseidon, the god of the sea. The two gods struggled against each other in order to gain the favor of the Athenian people. Poseidon used his trident and he offered sea water, but Athena, in turn, provided the olive tree, which was, in a sense, the natural tree of uh, Athens, and she won the competition, hence the name of the city-state. From then on, the Acropolis became a place of worship to the glory of the goddess. Unfortunately, the first temples erected on the hill in her honor were destroyed over the centuries. Archaeologists therefore focused their attention on the remains of these early monuments to picture the Acropolis of ancient times. At the end of the 19th century, Archaeological excavations revealed a strange succession of limestone blocks under the base of the present Parthenon. Scientists then discovered that the Greeks had profoundly altered the boulder in approximately 490 BC. On the north side of the site, they dug the rock to flatten the surface. To the south, at the edge of the cliff, the Greeks piled limestone to a height of 11 meters. Each of these blocks measured about half a cubic meter and weighed several hundred kilos. The goal was to build a gigantic platform 77 meters long and 31 meters wide. To do so, the Greeks arranged no less than 8,000 cubic meters of limestone. That's the equivalent of the volume of nearly three Olympic-sized swimming pools they created a perfectly flat surface at the top of the hill to hold a temple in honor of the goddess Athena, the pre-Parthenon. This building no longer exists, but the stones that made up the monumental platform intended to hold it are still clearly visible on the site. Here we can see the southwest corner of the large platform on which the pre-Parthenon was built. This here is the top level. On the other corner of the base, you can count up to 22 layers. They were built very well, as evidenced by these bands. They did an excellent job.
During their excavations, the archaeologists were also able to determine the shape of the pre-Parthenon. Considerably elongated, the building comprised six columns on its facade and 16 columns on the sides. This monumental temple housed two halls and is believed to have measured 23 meters wide by 67 meters long. Its height is estimated at nearly 14 meters. It was a building of exceptional dimensions, intended to celebrate the power of Athens. It was built in the aftermath of the Battle of Marathon, which was fought between the Athenians and the Persians in 490 BCE, and which led to an unexpected victory of the small city-state of Athens over the mighty Persian Empire. So, most scholars believe that this was a victory monument that celebrated the victory of the Athenians against the Persians, and a building that was funded with the spoils taken from the Persian army. On the present site occupied by the Parthenon, archaeologists also discovered marble blocks dating from the construction of the pre-Parthenon. The pre-Parthenon is an extremely important turning point in the architectural history of the Acropolis. This was the very first temple on the Acropolis to be built entirely of marble. For the first time in their history, the Greek builders embarked on the construction of a temple entirely composed of marble. At the time, this rare and extremely expensive material was only used to make little sculptures. It was imported in small quantities from islands several days away by boat. In these circumstances, how did the Athenians obtain the raw material necessary to erect such a building? A few decades before the construction of the Pre-Parthenon, the Greeks had discovered a hill located 17 kilometers northeast of Athens, Mount Pentelicus. This mountain, at an altitude of over 1,000 meters, contained large quantities of high-quality marble. Quite the windfall for the ancient builders. The marble of Mount Pentele is particularly good quality because it's very hard, it's, it polishes to a very shiny texture, but also, naturally, it has iron oxide in it, which gives a little bit of a more yellow glow than some of the other marbles. Twenty-five hundred years later, the deposit discovered by the ancient Greeks is still being exploited. It now supplies marble to the restorers of the Acropolis. Like the builders of that era, scientists face a major challenge. How to extract blocks of marble, both high grade and large enough to be used in construction. Marble is particularly complicated to extract because it has a lot of natural fissures in it or cracks, which means that you could be quarrying a large piece of marble and then at the last moment a huge crack emerges that you're not going to be able to fix. And also the marble is really hard, so it takes a very long time to chisel it out of the mountain. It's really impressive that the Greeks can do this with their tools. For their buildings, the Greeks had to extract blocks of marble that could weigh up to 13 tons each, the equivalent of the weight of two elephants. That means the extraction of such quantities of rock required extensive know-how. First, small slits were cut by the Greeks around the chosen block. Then they placed iron wedges, which they struck simultaneously with mallets. They repeated the operation hundreds, if not thousands of times, in order to cut out the block. 
Then they used heavy wooden levers, capable of multiplying a man's strength by 30. These levers allowed them to gradually detach the block from the main rock. To quarry marble is going to take a very long time, about two months per block. You know, it's exhausting work. The Greeks used clever kind of instruments like pulleys and levers to try and lessen the manpower that is needed, but it's still a huge feat of engineering to be able to create these monuments. Once the marble block was extracted, the men worked it on site to obtain the desired shape. For example, a rough timbre that would later be used to erect the columns. But once these blocks were partially cut, they still had to be transported. We do know that they needed dozens, if not hundreds, of expert workers and especially draft animals that would carry the individual weight of the gigantic architectural members of the Pre-Parthenon over a long distance. 17 kilometers separated the quarry from the Acropolis. To transport the marble blocks over such a distance, the Greeks used wooden carts pulled by mules. It could take an entire day to move a single block from the quarry to the foot of the Acropolis. When they reached the foot of the hill, the Greeks faced one last challenge. How to hoist these blocks weighing several tons to the top of the Acropolis, 157 meters up. Today, the path is particularly steep. But some of the stones found at the site allowed archaeologists to describe what it looked like back in antiquity. The first ramp that was used to lift the blocks for the pre-Parthenon was this one. The Greeks built a ramp 10 meters wide and 80 meters long, with an elevation gain of only 10 percent, ideal for moving the blocks to the top. They put these blocks on a cart, which was hoisted to the top by means of a pulley system firmly anchored to the ground. The rope that lifted this cart was connected by a second cart, pulled to the foot of the ramp by about 15 mules. Once at the foot of the hill, a new block was put in place and the mules were guided back up to be strapped to the empty cart at the top. This ingenious cable car system allowed each block of marble to be hoisted in just a few hours. While some workers moved the blocks, others began construction of the pre-Parthenon at the top of the Acropolis. To erect the columns of the pre-Parthenon, the Greek builders had to assemble the blocks on top of each other. On the current site, one of the tambors features curious protrusions that don't appear on any other stone. These types of valuable clues gave archaeologists a better understanding of the techniques used by the ancient Greeks. In classical Greek architecture, lifting the stone was a crucial step to seeing a project through. There were various techniques that allow straps to be attached to the blocks, some with protrusions and others with notches. The Greeks possessed very sophisticated hoisting devices. Wooden cranes capable of lifting 10-ton loads at a height of nearly 8 meters, the equivalent of a three-story building. The protrusions were then used as a fastener to lift the blocks with ropes in order to arrange them on top of each other with precision. Once the columns were carved, the protrusions were removed. 
but the construction of the Pre-Parthenon was never completed. After seven years, the site came to a sudden halt in 483 BC, even though work on the columns had barely started. The Persians, eager for revenge after their previous defeat, set out to invade Athens. Despite their best efforts, the Greeks lost the battle and the Acropolis was burned by the Persians. Everything is destroyed. The Pre-Parthenon's destroyed, all the sculptures, buildings that were on the Acropolis are just burnt out shells. It's just the symbolic end of Athens, really. After the Persians pillaged the city, the Athenian population was traumatized. No reconstruction was undertaken on the hill for about 20 years. After two decades of fierce struggles and numerous victories against the Persians, Athens began its rebirth around 460 BC. Thanks to the will of powerful leaders, the iconic hill experienced unprecedented architectural upheavals. The Greek builders began the construction of a huge platform at the top of the Acropolis, next to the one that had been erected to build the Pre-Parthenon. The original platform was 300 meters long and 85 meters wide. This area was expanded to a width of 150 meters. This gigantic artificial terrace formed an area of 45,000 square meters, the equivalent of more than four soccer fields. But these titanic works were only the beginning of what was to come. The 5th century is often known as a golden age in Athens because lots of major events happen that really shape the Athenians' identity about themselves. So we've got the emergence of democracy as a new experimental political system. Athens becomes the leader of the Greek city-states. So Athens as a city feels pretty emboldened to make more risks and to experiment, and this is reflected in the art that's created during this period. The man who embodied this architectural renewal was Pericles. Considered the founder of Athenian democracy, this savvy strategist undertook monumental work on the Acropolis in order to make it the cultural and political center of ancient Greece. In the mind of Pericles, the construction of temples on the Acropolis was closely linked to the promotion of the glory of the Athenian state. His project was colossal. It provided for the construction of a masterful entrance symbolized by the Propylaea. Directly adjacent, the Temple of Athena Nike was dedicated to Nike, the victorious personification of the goddess Athena. To the northeast, a temple was dedicated to Zeus and Poseidon, the Erecteion. Finally, on the south side, the Parthenon was to be the most imposing building on the site. It had to symbolize the grandeur of the Acropolis. It was the first to go under construction in 447 BC. Work on the Parthenon began at the site of the Pre-Parthenon, located south of the Acropolis. This way, it would be visible from the entire city. It was the masterpiece of antiquity. The Parthenon stood out among the monuments of the Acropolis and among all the buildings of Athens, thanks to its position at the top of the hill its dimensions, and its architectural perfection. By studying the building, scientists were able to establish that the Parthenon was in fact an enlarged copy of the Pre-Parthenon. Two columns were added to its facade and one to its length. 
bringing the building to a width of 31 meters and a length of 70 meters, with a height of 14 meters. A total of 120 columns supported this monumental building. The architects of the Parthenon took the general shape of its predecessor, but they didn't merely draw inspiration from it. The builders also recovered some of its marble that had been salvaged from the fire set by the Persians a few decades earlier. Here, there are parts of the pre-Parthenon that were integrated into the western wall of the actual Parthenon. We can distinguish them from those of the Parthenon because they have perfectly cut bands. And also thanks to this meticulous work done with a fine tip. The marble from Mount Pentelikus was precious, which is why the blocks that survived the destruction of the pre-Parthenon were repurposed to make the Parthenon after being reworked. The rest of the damaged blocks were used in other structures. While some blocks of the pre-Parthenon were recycled, the majority of the stones in the building had to be transported from the quarry all the way to the top of the hill. In all, the Greek builders used nearly 20,000 tons of marble to erect the Parthenon. That's the equivalent of twice the weight of the Eiffel Tower, a colossal edifice that sprung from the ground in record time. Construction went on for nine years until the year 438. The sculptures were shaped for another six years. The overall construction hence took a total of 15 years. This was an exceptionally short amount of time for work of such quality. It does mean that the completion of the Parthenon in record time was a priority of the Athenian state. It also means that there were hundreds of people employed on the works, and these were a combination of free citizens, foreign residents, and slaves. The Parthenon was completed only 15 years after work had begun. More than 13,500 blocks of marble were needed to erect this 70-meter-long and 31-meter-wide building. Its function was to protect the treasure and wealth of Athens, accumulated after the victories of the Greeks over the Persians. Part of this treasure was embodied by a gigantic 12-meter-tall statue of Athena, entirely made of marble and covered with 1,150 kilograms of gold. In her right hand, the goddess held a two-meter statue of Nike, the goddess of victory. In her left hand were a shield and a spear. The room in the center of the Parthenon was designed exclusively to house this monumental sculpture. The Parthenon was meant as a luxurious encasing for this treasure, which no longer exists. Its exceptional dimensions make it the largest marble monument in the world. But beyond its gigantic size, the Parthenon also conceals very subtle secrets of how it was built. Behind its apparent simplicity, the building is actually quite complex. For example, the side steps of the Parthenon seem perfectly straight. However, a very simple experiment reveals their real profile. This piece of wood is about seven centimeters thick. If I look on the other side, I can't see it because it's hidden by the curve of the stairs.
these steps, horizontal to the naked eye, are actually curved. Their center is seven centimeters higher. This choice wasn't made at random. Even though they're curved, the lines appear straight to the observer. The Parthenon is unique in the degree of detail it contains, and above all, in its optical refinement. The ancient Greeks incorporated imperfections into the plans and construction to make the Parthenon look even more than perfect. The steps are not the only things that deceive the eye. The columns also appear perfectly straight and at right angles. Yet appearances are deceiving. Each of the columns that make up the Parthenon is actually very slightly tilted towards the interior of the building. So much so that if we extended their lines, they would join about five kilometers in space and form a pyramid. But that's not all. In addition to being tilted, the columns bulge a few millimeters about halfway up. Again, this is an optical correction by a process called entesis, which means tension in Greek. When a column is perfectly straight, it looks narrower in the center. The bulge corrects this optical illusion, and the column then appears straight to the naked eye. There are almost no straight lines in the entire structure of the Parthenon. Proof that the ancient Greeks already possessed a perfect mastery of the laws of optics. If you position a square on the top and side, you see a deviation of a few millimeters towards the top. This means that the block was cut with a slight tilt to the right. One of the most spectacular things about the Parthenon is that what appears to be a perfectly rectangular, straight building is, as a matter of fact, full of curves. It is a curved building, and it has very few, if any, straight lines. Each block of marble was unique and individually carved to occupy a specific space in the building. As a result, and contrary to appearances, the Parthenon is not a giant Lego toy with interchangeable parts. The same holds true for the other buildings of the Acropolis, built in the 5th century BC. In just four decades, the ancient Greeks created four emblematic monuments on the Sacred Hill. The Parthenon, completed in 432 BC. The Temple of Athena Nike, inaugurated in 421 BC. And the Erechtheion, in 406 BC. The fourth construction, the majestic entrance to the site in the form of the Propylaea, was interrupted by the Peloponnesian War in 432 BC. Over the following centuries, the Acropolis was used as a fortress and the buildings remained relatively intact. During the rule of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, the Temple of Athena Nike was dismantled to build a wall that has since been destroyed. In addition, bombing later damaged part of the Parthenon, Erechtheion and Propylaea. Since the 19th century, many groups have tried to revive the various monuments. But where the ancient Greeks excelled, the first restorers failed.
the last restoration campaign, still ongoing today, began in 1975. Scientists found that many mistakes had been made by their predecessors. In 1975, the monuments of Acropolis were in critical condition. Then work began, and the blocks were dismantled to remove the damaged parts. We gradually realized that there was a lot more damage than what was visible from the exterior. Dedicated to the glory of the sacred goddess, the Temple of Athena Nike is particularly revealing of the clumsiness of the restorers of the past. For lack of adequate methods, they made many mistakes when laying the marble blocks. Determining the position of each block is a painstaking process, and various parameters have to be considered. The height, the measurements of the block, but also how the block is cut, meaning that the cutting tools must be chosen extremely carefully. It's like a puzzle that needs putting together. In all, three campaigns and two complete dismantlings were necessary to rebuild the temple to its original state from 2,500 years ago. The last restoration work was completed in the early 2010s. A total of 42 of the building's 327 blocks had to be switched back to their correct place. Some damaged elements were supplemented by new marble fragments. This meticulous work finally allowed visitors to see a faithful representation of the original. Right next to the Temple of Athena Nike, the Propylaea were also restored extensively. In so doing, Scientists were able to discover new construction secrets of the ancient Greeks. Today still, the magnificent building is the gateway to visitors at the top of the Acropolis. Originally, this building consisted of 34 meter high columns a huge central hall, and two side wings. Although the work on this monumental entrance could not be fully completed, this site played a strategic role within the Acropolis. The Acropolis was primarily a defensive fortified space and that the Parthenon was a treasury. If you have a huge treasury on a site, you need to keep it safe by even locking the whole Acropolis. So the Propylaea produced a proper, aesthetically pleasant gateway to the Acropolis, but more importantly, a gateway that was fully controlled by the guards of the Athenian Acropolis. When scientists set out to restore the Propylaea at the beginning of the 20th century, they had to replace some of the marble blocks that threatened to collapse. When dismantling the structure, the restorers found that the joints contained no traces of mortar to bind the blocks to one another. However, they discovered strange cavities containing iron pins dug into the marble. As a matter of fact, all of the rectangular blocks contain these cavities filled with iron elements. These pins were used to connect and reinforce the blocks. 
the ancient Greeks then poured molten lead into the cavities in order to protect the iron from corrosion. Adding lead has a lot of advantages because not only is it an antioxidant, so it prevents the iron from rusting, but also it creates better stability by making it more solid. By pouring in the molten lead, you're actually kind of creating a new piece of engineering to make sure that the blocks stay in place. This ingenious system was proof that the ancient Greeks knew how to give their monuments perfect stability. This was a vital aspect, as the Athens region is located in one of the most active seismic zones in Europe. Greece is located in the European seismic arc. There have been several major earthquakes since antiquity. They undoubtedly took that into account in designing their monuments. The walls of the buildings weren't the only elements integrating earthquake protection systems. The ancient Greeks also concealed ingenious earthquake-proof devices at the very heart of the columns of the buildings. The timbers of the columns were connected to each other by a system of wedges called impolia and wooden pegs called polos. This system made it easy to align the timbers during construction, but also acted as a flexible joint. In the event of an earthquake, the columns could move slightly and absorb ground movement. But the timbers remained solidly in place and allowed the structure to remain standing. Twenty-five hundred years after their construction, the front columns of the Propylaea still stand at the entrance to the Acropolis. Others, such as those of the Parthenon, had to be partially restored. More than a century after the first restoration campaigns, the Acropolis teams continue to work tirelessly. And even though these monuments will probably never look exactly as they did in antiquity, the current site allows visitors to grasp the magnitude of the work put forth by the ancient Greeks. These sparkling white colossal stone monuments continue to amaze anyone who looks at them. However, the surfaces of these buildings were not always so pristine. We knew that the Parthenon and all the monuments of the Acropolis had colors. We knew it from the literature and from color representation of 19th and 20th century. But we didn't know that these pigments and the polychromy still survived. So as soon as we had the access in the upper parts, we had this great surprise that the polychromy still remain in the marble surface. In 2012, during a new phase of restoration of the Parthenon, scientists gained access to previously inaccessible areas. This was particularly the case on the southwest side. Under Ottoman occupation from the 15th to the 19th century, this space was occupied by a mosque built inside the Parthenon itself. Today, the remains of the minaret of the mosque are still present. Notably, a staircase that leads to the highest walls of the Parthenon. Here, the walls of the old tower covered the marble of the column capitals for nearly five centuries, protecting them from bad weather and light. 
In 2012, when scientists examined the site for the very first time, they dug an opening into the wall of the mosque. That's when they discovered tiny traces of pigments. And here? This uh, demolition that happened in the Masary revealed the polychromy still existed in the impost block. The more intense color that we see in this member is uh, this uh, blue-green pigments. It was the paint color of the body of the leaf. Here we see behind the crusts. And uh, we see black lines that corresponded to the background of the pattern of the leaves. And again, blue color here. And uh, these black lines uh, were repeated every 16.5 centimeters, like here and here and here. These subtle remains are hard to discern with the naked eye. In addition, certain parts of the walls are covered with a thin black layer that is formed over time. But highly sophisticated devices can help reveal the most discrete colors. This portable microscope, we can see better the pigments that we can see with the visible eye, and we can record it. And uh, now we will see the colors magnified 30 times. And you see that uh, the pigments are in contact with the marble and behind the crust that happened because of the decay of the centuries. Everywhere the pigments are behind the crust. Here, this is the black line, and we can see the perpendicular line. This wonderful blue. Thanks to chemical analyses, archaeologists were able to confirm the presence of blue, green, red, ochre, and even black. These priceless remains, kept out of sight for nearly 500 years, bear witness to the various colors that once adorned the sculptures atop the columns of the Parthenon. The work of the scientists is still ongoing, but it allows us to imagine the appearance of the Parthenon during antiquity. The building used to be decorated with colorful friezes designed to make the sculptures more visible to the visitors looking at them from the ground. In reality, all the buildings were decorated this way. Notably, the Erechtheion and its six caryatids, statues of women that serve as columns. Thus reconstructed, the colors reveal the splendor of the temples of the Acropolis. To build the temples of the Acropolis, the ancient Greeks extracted and moved no less than 100,000 tons of marble, the equivalent of almost 10 times the weight of the Eiffel Tower. Then, in just a few years, they were able to erect structures just as monumental as they were refined. 2,500 years later, the architectural prowess of these builders continues to impress the entire world. We admire the know-how of the ancient Greeks, both for the cutting of the marble and the construction of the temples, but also for the design of the monuments and the calculations of their dimensions. This clearly required a certain genius.
The quality of their work and their ability to build these exceptional architectural structures with such precision are extremely impressive. It's no coincidence that monuments such as the Parthenon are part of the world's cultural heritage. For nearly two centuries, archaeologists have tried to revive these monuments and understand how the ancient Greeks managed to achieve this architectural feat. The thing that's really impressive about the ancient Greeks is that even though they're living in a distant time period, they're able to build these monuments that still survive today better than a lot of modern buildings that have been built more recently. To this day, researchers continue to ponder some of the methods used by the ancient Greeks. Started in the 1970s, the renovation of the Parthenon forges ahead, and the building hasn't yet revealed all of its secrets. Architects discovered that some of the building techniques that had been used by the Athenians were so advanced that they couldn't even be imitated and replicated with the use of computers. And it really seems difficult to understand how this was achieved. Some 2,500 years after construction, the marble of the Acropolis still holds many mysteries. Some of the monuments, like the Parthenon, will probably never be completely rebuilt. Nevertheless, they remain age-old testaments to the exceptional know-how of the Greek builders.